You see, we have to fight for these kind of things. We have to fight for our serenity. We have to, for me, for me, I, I can go down deep if I'm alone in a quiet space, especially surrounded by natural people. So here I'm a kid, I'm, I'm on the lookout for 10 weeks in the mountain peak and doing some serious soul searching. I was not going to happen with my life. And I realized at that time that you know, I was I going to call it, I had a big name to call. And I made that realization out there that was huge for me. One time the great Charles Kadagorsky was asked by somebody in an interview if his children had gone into music and he said in his wonderful Russian accent, No, he says, they haven't tasted the blood of music. <laughs> but when you taste the blood of music, you can't do anything else. You musicians know that out here. And I realized that a little bit later on that, but I had that realization on that lookout. And I came down off that lookout. Dedicated myself to becoming a musician of some sort and not writing a note of music until I was 20 years old. And being very well taught. And being associated with a great school at USC where I still am. With a great choral program and having English as my honor. You see. And so writing the sound of that most personal of human voices, just of the personal instrument, which is the human voice, and an ensemble of voices with great texts. Michael, your film is beautiful. It really is.
um, how it's through all uh, faith traditions and how it's living in the, the world through the sounds that the, the animals are making. This great song, you know it. And so uh, I look forward to continue to share this with you. Are there any questions from anybody or comments that you want to make? <clears throat> I teach at USC. I've been there for years. Uh, amongst other things, I set up and founded the Advanced Film Scoring Program there. So anyone out there that's interested in film scoring is the place to be. Which I think you'll see. Beautiful film, first of all. Uh, your music is uh, grateful and patient, and you give the, the listener a reason to be patient in a day when nobody has any patience, so thank you for that. Uh, I'm a piano tuner for 20 years. In the past, I've been working on the hand of uh, getting that piano and so on. <laughs> Clearly not very well. <laughs> tune yourself, because at the beginning of the film, it said that you had tuned it up. Well, I do. I have some instruments there. But I'm telling you right by the sea, in a flimsy old shack in the northwest of the United States, yeah, it doesn't do too well. But I love those old instruments, you know. That, that old Stein was 1890. And uh, you get by that, as, as I say, it's a tool. You know, there was, there was a wonderful documentary on Stravinsky. He's playing some of the widest string and some beat up old piano. And he's got this kind of Cheshire green, <laughs> green on his face. And he plays the bum 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 with this big smile on his face for that attitude. Yeah. Hey, use whatever's available. There's not much available on this particular island. There's no stores, and it's very, very hard to get to. There are no stores there at all on this island, and there, there's no electricity. Yeah, and you get to their outhouses. So when you get back to the basics, I have to haul my water aside from the ones that run up, once off my roof, the ones that washes the dishes and that kind of stuff. But um, you deal with it, you make music. Look, look, you people know this. Look at the great music that was made in concentration camps on whatever instruments that they could make. Talk to Messiaen. You deal with it with an hand and you overcome that and you create. Thank you. You're welcome.
do not be swayed by stuff that patently makes no sense. <laughs> it might be the current, uh, the, the, uh, current fact. Listen, you have to understand that I began my composition career in the 60s at a time where, as Andre Previn said, you write anything approaching the melody, you are dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know that, you older people know that. You go to, you go to the concerts in the 60s and 70s. A good example of that was a rocker, the great composer rocker. A card carrying serial. And a very fine composer writing the serial video. His son dies suddenly. And Rockford wants to write an elegy for his son. And he found out that for him it was not possible for him to do it in the language that he had been writing serial music. And he wrote a piece that had tonal centers in it. And he said he lost every one of his friends in Abdemi. No more lunches, no more Christmas cards, no more cards. <laughs> because George wrote something with a tonal center and something resembling a lot of line. Now, I, going through this, I have great respect for composers who do very abstract serial music and all that. I have some pieces that are very abstract that are atonal too. Listen, if you're going to set edgy poems by Lorca on time and night that are very abstract, then you want to use that kind of language, I think, in, in complimenting that. But I thought that that was just nuts. I thought that was patently nuts. What's wrong with writing a line, a melodic line? And so I totally ignored all that stuff. And, and Campbell had it right, you follow your own list. And for those of you young people out there, that's a very crucial thing. You have your own voice deep down, and you follow that, and you stand up, and you carry the bars, and you forget about that kind of criticism about style and all that kind of stuff. You simply do the best thing you can, which is what you heard after the, the song within all of us. And so there you go. You see. You, you know, were in a situation where it wasn't uh, possible, where you felt comfortable in writing, you know, this kind of stuff. You should be simply saying, screw it. <laughs> and you, know, <laughs> you do what you want. And you follow your own list, and you do the very best you can. Now, in my own, I, I do have a of writing a line. And people ask me, who, who are your influences? And those composers who knew how to write a line, this is why I mentioned Jerome Kern. And I put him right in the same category as I do Brahms and Schumann and all those. And Cole Porter and Richard Rogers and all those people. That, that's timeless music that goes deep inside us. And they knew what to do with the line. Now, if my thing is writing lines and combining with poetry, I've ended up devoting my career to that. And I don't worry about any of this other stuff at all. And you should do that. You follow your own list, and you have to be very tough to do that sometimes. You have to stand up to all sorts of stuff, and you just walk right through it. Then you come out the other end. <laughs> Had I listened to any of that stuff, there would have been no honors. There would have been no shining eyes. There would have been no David Tom. Certainly not looks at him. Follow your own bliss and be brave. And hone your skills. And learn everything you can about your art. And for you choristers out there, devote as much time to music. To the words, the words, the words. Spend time with Rilke. He's a fascinating character about Robert Graves. How about talk to the room? Get into their life. Get into their art before you even go to the music. Then you go to the music. 
It's a great pleasure to have Tim Schott here. Tim Schott has come all the way from Oklahoma City to be here with us tonight. Tim, Tim is an esteemed conductor. He and I have done two full awards and programs at Carnegie Hall in the past, and he is the National Director of the American Coal Directors Association. 